Blessings, beloveds, Anastasia, Cosmic Astrologer. Welcome back to my channel. And thank you so much for watching and tuning in. And again, thank you for all your lovely comments um, and your feedback and your questions. I appreciate all of those and I do try my best to get back to all of them. Right, so what I want to share with you guys today is more or less a follow up on my um, latest video, which is where I was discussing um, planets in the third house uh, are often squaring the ascendant axes of the birth chart. And what I discussed in relation to that was how when a planet is squaring the ascendant, it pretty much comes through the individual's um, expression. So when they, because the third house is communication, it is all these other things which I won't unpack because I've slightly touched on that in the previous video. So please watch the previous one if you haven't. Um, but any planet in the third house is going to affect how a person expresses themselves and how they communicate as well. And the, the second part to that, which is just as important and is, is looking at it from um, a more holistic perspective, is that the, the planet that's squaring the ascendant uh, from the third house is also squaring the descendant. Um, it cannot be any other way. So what I'd like to do today is just touch on um, that exact point when a planet is in the third house squaring the descendant. So really what we're talking about then is the, the relating axis, the relationship axis, which is the ascendant and the descendant of the birth chart. So that, that horizontal line from the ascendant to the descendant is called the relationship axis. And when we have planets um, squaring the ascendant, descendant, then those planets are very much tied up in the person's uh, relationship how they relate to people and certainly how they relate to themselves as well. So a planet in the third house squaring the ascendant is going to affect how the individual communicates and expresses and, and how they are received and understood when they are communicating um, from those around them or to those around them. And that planet that's squaring the ascendant, which is also squaring the descendant, then um, implies that that energy of that planet in the third house is also having a direct contact with the relationship sphere of the chart. So the relationships that this individual has. So whatever planet that is, in other words, in the third house that squares the ascendant, descendant axis, it's, it's basically playing out as, as a really prominent archetypal energy, character, force, whatever you want to call it. Um, into the sphere of relationships. So if a, if a person has, um, let's just say Pluto in the third house squaring the ascendant descendant, then Pluto is not only going to, you know, characterize how that person communicates, which is quite uh, intensely with quite a lot of power um, through their vocal uh, cords and, and their voice and their words. So when they're projecting their words, there's a lot of power to that for the person simply because Pluto represents power amongst many other things. Um, but it's also going to come into the person's relationships. So it wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be surprised if when a person has Pluto swearing that relationship axis, that Pluto shows up in quite a um, intense and um, impulsive, compulsive, um, power struggles, um, transformations, all those sorts of things that Pluto represents will basically play out in the sphere of relationships for the person. So as I um, mentioned in my last video, pay attention to planets in the third house squaring the ascendant. Now what you need to look at is that that planet is actually squaring the descendant as well. So that planet in the third house squaring the ascendant descendant is a primary key player in how this person relates, how this person relates to people and how this person relates in their relationships, okay? And um, 
you know, there's the world of relationships is such a huge um, component to life and experience to life because we are relating all the time. You know, we are relating with everybody. Of course, we are relating on different levels with different people and in different circumstances and experiences. But essentially, we are relating to people all the time. The minute we respond to somebody, we're relating, you know, whether it's in a five second conversation or whether it's in our, um, you know, our personal life with our friends and our, our family um, or with our lover or with our um, colleagues, who, whoever, you know, the, the local man in the milk bar, we're always relating. That's, that's a primary function of our, our being. It's a primary function of how we connect, you know, how we connect to life and how we connect to the world and people. And certainly how we connect with ourselves. So the the relationship access, which is the ascendant descendant, is huge. You know, the, the four angles in the chart are huge, period. Um, but in this case today we're talking about the ascendant descendant. So when you have planets on the ascendant or on the descendant, or planets in the third house squaring the ascendant descendant. All these energies are basically describing the world of relationships for you and how you relate, how you connect, how you share, um, what your blind spots are, what your challenges are, what your gifts may be, what your ideals may be. Speaking of ideals, um, Neptune in the third house, you know, can also be, when it's squaring the ascendant, descendant, adds that um, idealistic you know, uh, element to life in terms of how a person relates, how they relate within the, their own self and certainly how they are relating to others in, in their relationships. Um, when you are assessing the dynamic of relationships in your own chart or in anybody's chart, there are so many factors that come into it. And I'm, you know, I'm really just pointing to one at the moment, which is really, really important, you know, when planet is in the third house, squaring the ascendant, descendant, because it becomes a key player in that relationship axis. But as I said, you know, if there are planets on the ascendant, then those planets are going to be opposite the descendant. And if there are planets on the descendant, the seventh house of the birth chart, then clearly they're opposite the ascendant. So they're, they're playing in to the relationship axis. Planets on, on any of the four angles are super, super important and um, incredibly dynamic and active in the person's life. But when you're exploring the world of relationships, naturally you are looking at Venus, you are looking at the sign of Venus, you're looking at the house location and the aspects. And you are also looking at Mars and the same, um, the same principles apply, you know, sign, house, aspects. And then you are looking at the ascendant, you're looking at the descendant, so you're looking at the rulers of those houses as well. Um, you also pay attention to the second house because the second house is ruled by Venus and the second house really describes the internal value system that we hold about ourselves and therefore then um, connecting back to the seventh house because Venus rules the second house and the seventh house. So the, the second house rulership, which is Taurus, is associated with our internal value system and our survival system as well, which is connected to procreation. So, you know, one of the main ways that we have this instinctual um, desire to to want to keep going is through procreation and, and that is ruled by the second house which is then opposite to the eighth house which is the house of sexuality on another completely different dimension um, so when you're assessing relationships you are looking at always the ascendant any planets on the ascendant because they're going to tie into descendant seventh house you look at the second house because that tells you about the person's internal value system um, and just basically what they value about themselves. So issues around self-worth and self-esteem all derive from the second house. 
Now, if a person has troubles with self-esteem and self-worth, they're going to play into their relationship. It's just how it is. Um, so going around the chart, Ascendant, second house, seventh house, pay attention to the eighth house as well. Seventh and eighth house are energies that we generally project onto the relationship, project onto the other person. And depending on the nature of the relationship, obviously will you know depend then uh, what, what we're actually projecting. Um, the seventh house, it is the house of relationships, but you know, it's the house of many different types of relationships. It can be um, the relationship between you and your astrologer, the relationship between you and your therapist, the relationship between you and your lawyer. Um, any relationship really is the seventh house. So the eighth house, you know, takes us into those deeper dimensions that incorporate the deep psychological sexual components to our being, um, which penetrate very, very deeply. But the eighth house is also correlated to our family and our parents when we are very young. So for example, if you had a lot of planets in the eighth house, when you were um, a little child, what happens is those eighth house planetary energies get projected onto the mother and father and the, the family dynamics around you. So you experience those energies through your family. So having really um, intense, complex uh, planets in the eighth house can often um, be a, a huge significator to the person having experienced um, very intense complex dynamics at a very young age that are very difficult to process and understand and you know um, do end up becoming a part of the person's psychological template uh, so there's a lot of work that probably needs to be um, proce processed and healed and understood when a person has a lot of planets in the eighth house because then as they grow into adulthood these templates have formed internally and psychically and psychologically and emotionally and they become a complex component of the individual and therefore then what they project into their relationships and what they experience as a result of that. Um, then we can add in the 12th house, which is the house of transcendence ultimately, but Another way of looking at the 12th house regarding relationships is that the 12th house becomes uh, what we project on that uh, idealistic level, you know. So it's the projection of the god, goddess, um, archetypal energy or ideal that we project onto our partner. So, you know, we meet somebody and we think they're amazing, they're incredible. They're, they're perfect and, you know, they're just, they're, so, they're ideal as it appears initially. And I'm sure all of you have potentially experienced that at least once in your life. Um, so the 12th house is very tricky in that way. Whatever sign is on the 12th house cusp and its ruler is going to describe what you're projecting onto your partner from that idealistic level. But ultimately the 12th house is about transcendence. So you know, you can see why relationships are very complex. They have so many different dimensions to them, um, all of which derive essentially from your own self and what you've integrated into yourself, um, you know, what your soul's desires are, um, what your internal um, value systems are, what your ideals are and so forth. And then certainly you know, what you are unconsciously projecting onto the other because um, it is very, 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 very typical in relationships. What happens is we, we project the unconscious components within ourselves onto our partner. So we see in our partner the very things that either repel us or attract us, but they are actually things about ourselves that we need to integrate and um, learn about ourselves and the way we do that is through projecting them onto the other person onto the relationship which uh, the relationship is a mirror to ourselves so the partner mirrors back to us what is unconscious within us 
so you know that's that subject is in itself that the subject of unconscious projections and transference uh, is is um, a very very deep subject that has a lot of layers and um, you know perhaps this is a little bit over the top for some people who you know who haven't studied psychology or haven't you know deeply studied astrology um, but it is important to mention these things because they they make up the, the whole experience and, and um, the various dimensions of relationships so um, just to summarize on, on, on what I've um, as said so far today planets in the third house when they are squaring the ascendant and descendant they are key players in the world of relationships for you um, they describe so much about how you relate um, in relationships so each planet whatever planet is in that third house that planet's archetypal characteristics are going to describe what plays out in the arena of relating in relationships for you. Um, you know, if it's Mars, and I did touch on Mars in the previous video, if it's Mars, then when the person communicates, you know, they're, they're very assertive, um, they're very direct, um, very honest, sometimes to their own detriment. Um, can come across as quite pushy and even aggressive, you know, at, at a at a more um, I don't know uh, negative level, you know, for lack of a better word. And certainly, you know, then when we bring in the descendant, because Mars is squaring the descendant, if it is squaring the ascendant, then you know that's that's a potential signature for a lot of conflict in relationships. So. If somebody was looking at, at their chart and they didn't have any planets in the seventh house and they had Mars in the third house and they weren't paying attention to this Mars in the third house, well, then they're overlooking something very significant because no planets in the seventh house doesn't mean that the person's relationship life isn't active. There are many people who don't have planets in the seventh house who have uh, many relationships in their life. So again, that's another reason why you need to be paying attention to planets squaring the ascendant descendant axes. Um, planets on the ascendant, planets on the descendant, they all tie into the world of relationships. The 12th house is our, you know, our ideal version of what we project onto a partner. The second house is our own internal value system and our uh, need and desire to survive uh, through procreation um, and the uh, seventh house is pretty much what we project onto people uh, and so can the eighth house be that as well don't forget a lot of these components that are related to projection are unconscious when something is unconscious um, it's it's a very powerful driving Force. So another way of putting that would be to say that there are a lot of behaviours that people display that are driven from the unconscious components within. And when a person is looking at that behaviour about themselves, for instance, and they're trying to make sense of it on a rational, logical level, um, that they're, they're not able to to see the rationale behind it. Mm -hmm. They they can be left thinking, um, you know, questioning why. Why am I behaving like this? What is what is this behaviour about? Um, why am I reacting like this to this person or these situations? You know, and then of course there's the dimension of when we're talking about relationships in terms of when you are in a relationship with somebody, whatever relationship that may be, but certainly intimate relationships seem to be the ones that trigger the most in all of us all of us um, then you know the the thing to be looking at is in relationship astrology you need to be looking at the composite chart and the synastry chart between the two people now i've done a couple of videos on composite charts and i've spoken about what a composite chart is and i've spoken about the composite sun and the composite moon through the houses so just check back in my video list and, and you will see those videos there. They're very useful to look at 
Um, and I guess I will eventually expand on that and look at the rest of the planets in the composite chart. And furthermore, I will also do some videos on synastry astrology. Very simply put, um, you know, in synastry astrology, for instance, um, if your natal moon is conjunct your partner's Mars um, by synastry or squaring it or opposite it, or even in a composite chart, if you had a moon Mars conjunction aspect, that's that's a very uh, very challenging aspect to have in a personal relationship, okay? Because Mars is, is basically anger and conflict. Um, it's the desire to to want to have your own way and do your own thing, and that doesn't really work in relationships because relationships are about balance and about harmony. And about compromise some people don't like that word and don't like to think that they should have to compromise and that's fine each to their own but if we if we understand relationships from the libra archetypal energy then we we need to learn to balance we need to learn to give and take we need to learn to compromise we need to learn um, that yes we can be independent and assertive but we need to be able to do that in a way where we are still being considerate of the other person. So you see, Seventh House is always about balance and sharing um, and, yeah, and harmonising the energies between two people. So bring the moon and Mars together. You know, moon is about person security or the security of the relationship, the emotional security and the, the ego um, security of the relationship as well. And, you know, Mars next to the moon or aspecting the moon in a hard aspect it's it's going to stir up some emotional distress you know in the relationship so look synastry and composite relationship astrology is very powerful very 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 powerful and very very telling um and you know i guess you know some people might query well I'm in a relationship where I, you know, really love this person. I really want to make this relationship work, but we have a moon Mars aspect. How can how can we overcome that? Um, the answer to that question is not so simple because it would really um, depend on a number of different things. And the best way to, for me to answer that question would be to to be looking at a, a specific chart of two people, for instance. So I won't answer it generally but i guess um how i will answer it is in this way um the the archetypal energies that are present are always there but the uh potential for transcending energies and working with them um in a much more conscious way with awareness is also um, certainly there so it just comes down to awareness consciousness and you know um both people having that awareness and consciousness and, and working through these things uh consciously otherwise the uh the flip side of that coin is those forces are operating unconsciously and therefore we're projecting them onto each other as it were and um upsetting each other and so forth and um just one final point that I'd like to uh, finish up on this video, which is a really beautiful, beautiful, powerful example of um, transcendence of uh, planets, in, meaning how we can transcend the chart or how we transcend energies. And, you know, transcendence comes from our soul's desire, okay? It comes from Pluto, so Pluto's location in the chart, where Pluto is and, and uh, what that is speaking through your chart. And then if we um, bring in the model of evolutionary astrology, we can also bring in the model of esoteric astrology, which has a very, very similar um, platform in terms of souls that incarnate. There's a large portion of souls that uh, are operating on what EA calls the consensus level and 
there's a smaller uh, portion operating on the individuated level and there's a very small portion like two or three percent operating at a spiritualized level esoteric astrology also has that view and it brings them through what's called um, the cardinal fixed or mutable cross in the birth chart and I think that's a separate video altogether so I will leave that aside for now but I guess what I'm trying to say is if that you know I mean it's much more complex than this naturally but the point I'm trying to make is if if two souls are born into this life and are operating from a consensus state and they have really intense um, conflicting relationship dynamics in the chart it is going to be a lot more difficult to transcend those energies and to um, yeah to have um, relationships without those tensions and those conflicts I guess you could say just to put it very simply and generally again you know it always depends on a number of different factors okay so I'm just making some general statements um, so going back to the issue of transcendence uh, what I want to do is I want to show you guys Carl Jung's chart Carl Jung I'm sure most of you are aware of who uh, he was and what he brought um, to consciousness you could say to, to the world uh, he was born in the 1800s so he's clearly not around now but he's he's the father of psychology you could say um, but he's he's such an important figure in terms of um, what he brought to the world of psychology because of what the work that he did which was very much about the the unconscious and conscious components within us so the whole concept of projection and transference very much ties into the work that he did the world of archetypes um, is his work as well so when we refer to the astrological signs um, in the zodiac we, we speak about them as being archetypal energies so that's the work of Carl Jung um, Carl Jung transcended the world of psychology uh, through using astrology as well he was a psychiatrist a psychoanalyst he was also an astrologer so he used the world of psychology and transcended uh, the world of psychology through astrology and um, his chart is incredible in so many different ways but one thing that I just want to point to today which ties into um, a planet in the third house um, squaring the ascendant descendant and I just had a look at a quick video uh, recently and um, it's just very very interesting what he said so first let me just share my screen and um, show you uh, his chart so this is a chart of Carl Jung and all we're interested in looking at today is the fact that he's got um, three degrees of Aquarius rising so there's his ascendant um, he's got Saturn in the first house uh, his descendant is three degrees of Leo and uh, his son is at three degrees of Leo so right on the descendant and he's got um, a number of different things in his seventh house including Uranus now Uranus and the Sun are the, are the primary things that I would be focusing on in this chart Juno as well and Ceres but if we're just uh, thinking about planets then yeah I would be sticking to the Sun and Uranus um, speaking through this chart now the seventh house if you go to see a therapist or you become a therapist of some sort or a practitioner a healing practitioner of some sort whether it's in the conventional or alternate world the seventh house rules any of those uh, professions okay so uh, Carl Jung was a healer a therapist he was um, he was an innovator you know he he transcended the world of psychology essentially you know at, at a time where nobody was thinking the way he was that's Uranus in the seventh house by the way 
Um, but leaving all that aside, what I wanted to bring to your attention is, see down here, he's got, in the third house, he's got Chiron, Neptune, the Moon and Pluto. Now, out of all these planets, Neptune is exactly square his ascendant and descendant axis. So Neptune played a very big part in um, how he expressed himself and uh, how he communicated and how he related in the world of relationships and certainly how he related to his patients or clients or, or whatever you want to call them. Um, patience is a very old term, you know, that comes from the world of psychiatry and um, in in this day and age in the world of psychology, uh, a lot of psychologists, they, they don't even use that word because it seems to disempower people. Anyway, that's another story. So what I want to share with you is I, uh, as I said, I watched a video where he was, um, he was asked a question by the person who was interviewing him. This video was um, an interview that was conducted in 1956. And the interviewer asked Carl Jung, when you think back to your youth, is there a point um, in your youth at all that you can recall or remember where you first experienced um, the realization of consciousness, your own individual consciousness? And his response was remarkable because his response actually speaks through Neptune in the third house literally his response was uh, yes as a matter of fact i do recall it was in my 11th year of school he said and then he said i was walking to school and i suddenly walked out of a mist now neptune rules mist okay fog mist and and so forth and he's got neptune you know, squaring his ascendant, descendant axis. So when he turns around and says, I realised I had this um, sort of conscious awareness that I had stepped out of the mist and it dawned on me, I realised that, you know, um, that, I was, that I was consciousness. But then I was asking questions of, well, who was I before this realisation? and so on and so forth. You'd need to watch the entire interview to get more out of that. But all you really need to hear for the purposes of what I'm demonstrating today is the fact that he said, I was walking to school in my 11th grade and I remember walking out of a mist. <laughs> That's such a beautiful, literal um, translation of Neptune in the third house at, uh, squaring his ascendant, descendant axis. So there's, um, yeah, a very powerful example of a very powerful soul that really um, changed so much about consciousness um, for everyone, really. So I'll just stop sharing that screen. Um, just want to see if there's anything else I'd like to add. I think um, just one other little tip for you guys. It's um, very useful to pay attention to the elements of the signs when you're assessing relationships or any of the chart really. But in this case, we are talking about relationships. So what I mean is this, very simply put, you know, we, the, the four elements are earth, air, fire and water. Okay, now the elements are huge in astrology. They're, I mean, they're, they're huge in life. You know, the elements are living and breathing all around us and within us. And certainly that is the case um, within astrology, okay, and the archetypal uh, zodiacal signs and planets for that matter, uh, because each sign is a particular element and each planet has a particular quality of an element to it as well. It's watery or fiery and so forth, earthy, etc. Um, the air and fire signs. So if a person had, um, you know, Venus in Aries and um, Aries on the descendant and um, Mars in Aquarius, so that's 
fire and air that I've just um, described, right, pointed to. Air and fire are the sign or the elements that connect to freedom and taking risks. So you would expect when a person has those elements strong, dominating the world of relationships, that they are they are more the freedom seekers in the world of relationships. So they would need a relationship that enabled them to feel free and adventurous and um, able to take risks and so forth. That's really important to pay attention to because that if you're looking at your chart or somebody else's chart, it's going to give you a massive, massive clue into how that person functions in relationships just by simply looking at the elements. Um, not only how they function, but what they need and what they seek and desire as well. Mars is desires, okay? And Venus is also related to, um, you know, what we attract and what we appreciate and what we give, right? So if we have a lot of fire and air in our chart in the world of relationships, we're going to really value freedom, you know, and we're going to really uh, want that in our relationship and we're going to give that to the relationship and the other person as well because we value it. It's, in, it's inherent within us in our value system. Um, on the other hand, if you notice that um, your own chart or somebody else's chart is strong in the water and earth element regarding assessing relationship in the birth chart, which is, as I said, looking at the ascendant, descendant, second house, um, eighth house and twelfth house, planets in the third house, squaring the ascendant, descendant, all those components um, come into the world of relating and relationships. So if there's a lot of water and earth in, in that, that assessment of relationships, then you'd be looking at an individual who has a very high need of security, you know, so they're, they're not the risk takers, they're not the, the freedom seekers, they are the seekers who need stability and security. They are the two sort of key words that you can associate, there's many more, but two main ones that you can associate with water and earth is security and stability. And fire and air is freedom, adventure, risk taking and so forth. So even just by that, you can see um, how it can quickly alert you and tell you, you know, how this particular individual functions, as I said, and also what they need in relationships and what they're looking for. So I'll leave that there for you guys. And um, hopefully there's some useful tips for you there to, to ponder on if you haven't already considered any of these um, points that I've raised today. And um, yeah, I'll leave that part of the video there. I just would like to say, um, wondering how you are all feeling today. The moon is in Scorpio over the next couple of days. And um, we've just had the solstice. Um, you know, we've got another three eclipses coming up by the end of this year. We're in uh, certainly within range for the next two coming up, which is next month. We've got a solar partial eclipse and a total lunar eclipse. Um, so, yeah, energies are pretty intensified. Um, and the moon in Scorpio today, I, I, always, um, I always know when the moon is in Scorpio and when the moon is in Pisces. For some reason, Oh, and Aquarius too, actually. Those three signs seem to just wake something up in me on, you know, on the day that the moon, the minute or the second the moon goes into that sign. I mean, I'm pretty aware of where the moon is because I'm working with astrology on a daily basis. But even if I had forgotten for some reason, I, I, I can actually feel it. You know, it's a very strong intuitive connection to um, the moon cycle. I do have moon in the first house, so um, my moon is in an angular house. It's um, quite a strong moon. So moon energies um, and moon cycles, I yeah, I connect with very, very strongly. Not in a cancer way because my moon's in Aquarius. I've said that before. So I pulled out a card um, from my little um, 
isosorical deck and I just want to leave you guys with uh, this. I think this is a beautiful uh, card for the moon in Scorpio um, over the next two days. I, for those of you who are not connected with me on Facebook, I, every time I post um, something astrological or even just a picture of myself, my, the line that I seem to resonate with most and that I always put as a little quote above my pictures and so forth is, I am the divine feminine and I speak the language of the stars. And I really feel that particular um, I just made that up myself. I didn't, I didn't actually even, there was no thought that went into that. It just came to my intuition one day um, when I was posting something. I wrote it and it's just sort of stayed with me. Uh, it's been with me for a while. Um, and uh, this is the card that came up. Queen of Heaven. I thought it was a very beautiful card. So, um, the heading for that is Blessings from the Divine Empress of the Skies. I thought, gee, how appropriate given that, you know, I feel that I am the Divine Feminine speaking, you know, the language of the stars and this is what I do when I do these videos. But I pull this card uh, for everybody and for anybody who's watching this uh, who may or may not resonate with this particular energy at the moment. And um, I'll just read uh, a couple of things that it says about this card. So the Queen of Heaven, the Divine Empress of the Skies, acknowledges your feminine authority now. As a man or a woman, you have a life path of spiritual leadership to bring qualities of mercy, compassion and wisdom into the world. Beautiful. Um, I'll read a little bit more. The Oracle of the Queen of Heaven is a confirmation of your feminine leadership and spiritual authority whether in male or female body this lifetime because clearly we all embody the divine feminine and divine masculine within us we you know it cannot be any other way uh, isis means throne and in her presence and blessing uh, as divine empress of the skies she offers in she offers initiates of the light which I believe I am, and I'm sure a lot of you feel you are and believe you are as well. Uh, men and women, great feminine spiritual power. Feminine spiritual authority occurs when power is tempered with mercy, uh, wisdom, compassion, and love. It is inspired spiritual leadership through the heart and the model of power and authority that is based in empowerment rather than force or control. I thought that was interesting that those words came up in this description because, you know, the moon in Scorpio on a very um, unhealthy uh, level is, you know, can be very obsessive, controlling, compulsive, manipulative and so forth. Um, but certainly when one, you know, is working with energies uh, within themselves on a higher uh, conscious level with more awareness, um then they they don't have the um need to want to control or manipulate <laughs> um you know or uh, play games around you know control power struggles and so forth so i just thought it's interesting that this card came up with the moon being in scorpio at the moment and the essential message is about you know queen of heaven because <laughs> you, you know, we're, we're all the queen of heaven. We all, we all embody that divine feminine. And in this case, um, it is the divine feminine that's being emphasized um, and sharing the message that, you know, um, your, your uh, divine femininity um, speaks through leadership, authority and spiritual knowledge. So, um, have a reflect on that. It may or may not resonate with you, but I just felt inspired to pull that card out. I literally just pulled it before I started this video. So in, enjoy uh, listening to what I've shared with you today. Uh, you probably have to go back and maybe pause and maybe make a couple of notes. So there's a few good pointers there. So hopefully you enjoy them. Thanks for watching and uh, many blessings. 
and I'll see you all soon. Namaste. Take care. Much love. Bye. Bye.